So hear now the word of God. It's coming out of the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, home of Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Lazarus and his sister hosted a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who joined him at the table. Then Mary took an extraordinary amount, almost three quarters of a pound, of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She anointed Jesus' feet with it, then wiped his feet dry with her hair. The house was filled with the aroma of the perfume. Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, complained, this perfume was worth a year's wages. Why wasn't it sold and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He carried the money bag and would take what was in it. Then Jesus said, leave her alone. This perfume was to be used in preparation for my burial, and this is how she has used it. You will always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be gracious and glorious to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, if you have noticed as we have gone through this Lenten journey so far, we've been in the Gospel of Luke, but here we jump to the Gospel of John. John is sprinkled into the three-year rotation called the Revised Common Lectionary. And today we get this wonderful story of Mary's generous gift to Jesus. When we think of generosity, what do you think of? Jesus has some huge moments of generosity in John's gospel. Jesus' generosity moves to the side of abundance very quickly in most of those stories. Abundance seems to follow Jesus. I mean, just look at the first chapter of John, that beautiful poetry from John 1. Verse 3 says, Everything came into being through the Word, and without the Word, nothing came into being. What came into being through the Word was life, and the life was the light of all people. All of life is a generous gift that comes from the Word. You are a generous gift of the Word, of God's Son, Jesus Christ. So how do we react to such generosity and abundance? Church architecture is something I love to witness and think through, and I will admit that I I love touring churches and seeing how things are set up and how things were thought through in those different uh, spaces. When I first was appointed here and was the first time walking into this sanctuary, it made me think a lot about why things are the way that they are. Why is the choir a full story above everybody else? Why is there such a large cross hanging over the altar? Why is it that the door that 95% of the people use to get in the sanctuary is only one door and there's four doors to welcome in the other 5% who come through the front door? I ask these questions, not with a huge amount of judgment, but because I'm actually curious of what led people to make those decisions. I guess it's the church geek in me, but I love to see how people physically do church in the building and in the design and how practically things are done every day. Now, you don't find many people building churches like they did in this one, that they did a thousand years ago. This is a picture of Wells Cathedral in Somerset, England. It was built from year 1175 to 1490. And you think it takes a long time to do things in the United Methodist Church. But this is one of the first Gothic structures in England. Standing in front of it, you are blown away by its massiveness. And to think that this was created all before 1500. It's unbelievable. This is York Minster in York, England. It's one of the largest cathedrals in England. There are so many stained glass windows. This is just a small portion of them. And you can see how incredible they are. Plus, you have the incredible ceiling above them. 
Can you imagine being in such a place where you're just surrounded? Everywhere you look, there's such craftsmanship and such beauty and such meaning to everything, including the ceiling. Can you imagine worshiping there every week? It's the type of place where you, wa- you walk in and it just exudes sacredness. You simply walk in and can feel it. There's another place like that even in North Carolina one of the more famous neo-Gothic cathedrals in North Carolina. This is Duke Chapel. And you don't see many styles of this in other places in the United States very often. I love the windows in this chapel. The upper windows, they tell the story of the, New Test- or the Old Testament. And the lower set of stained glass windows, they all tell stories from the New Testament. I love that the windows tell stories for people to interact with, to learn from. However, Gothic or neo-Gothic architecture doesn't necessarily have a grip on what makes a church beautiful. There are plenty of modern ones too. I would love to visit this one. This is the one so far I haven't seen. This is the Thorn Crown Chapel in Arkansas. It, also, it is also known as the Glass Church in the Woods. <clears throat> the windows make it look like you're literally worshiping outside. The reflections of the woods on the inside and the outside is amazing. It looks truly like a holy place in the midst of creation. I'm also, I'm also fascinated with this one, the see-through church in Belgium. This is a very, it's very unique. And they don't really have a saint, uh, congregation that meets there. It's more of a place of reflection. But you can see right through it. And there's so much theology in that idea. The church should be transparent, open, and share the same air as the outside world. We aren't created to be recluses inside of our sanctuaries, but we are called to share the love of God outside of these walls. Now, the point that I'm making with all of this is there was a lot of thought and a lot of intention created in these buildings. These aren't the buildings, though, that the majority of churches build. As we get to our new master plan that we'll be starting to create, as we start the next step in the transformation journey, I'm not suggesting that we build Wells Cathedral or York Minster here in Salisbury. This isn't a commentary whatsoever about any ideas of renovations or plans for our green space. The main point is, is and what I think the story of John's text points out, is God can be glorified through generosity and abundance through brazen or bold and shocking acts of beauty. Each of these buildings I showed took an immense amount of money to construct. Each building on our campus took an immense amount of money to build. But why build a glass chapel in the middle of the woods? Why build a church that you can literally see through? Why spend hundreds of years constructing Gothic cathedrals? I mean, can you imagine being the architect of Wells Cathedral, knowing that you are not going to be alive, probably to even see the walls being built, and yet that your great, 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 great grandchildren may actually get a chance to worship in that cathedral at some point? I mean, why do that to yourself? I'm sure this is the question many people asked when they came together to build the largest United Methodist Church in the United States. This is the Church of the Resurrection in Leewood, Kansas, the church that Adam Hamilton started. This is a massive worship space. But the most impressive thing is the stained glass window in the back. It is one of the world's largest stained glass windows, 100 feet wide and 40 feet tall. It cost $3.4 million to make. Now, if you talk to the over 2,900 people who gave to make that window a reality, they would speak of how this window connects them deeper with God. The sense of the Holy Spirit in this place as they come to worship every week. The sacredness that comes with it. It's similar to our windows. They probably were not $3.4 million, but... The front windows over here, the front of the church, the ones that I look at and the choir look at every week. You come through those front doors, those 5% of you, and underneath these different colors of blue represent our baptism. They unify us as we come to this place as a body of Christ, as the church. The windows above me and above the altar are yellows and reds representing the Holy Spirit like fire. 
It is here that we come to feel the presence of God, to partake of the sacraments and to hear the word of God, and then to be sent out to do the work of the church. Someone was really thinking when they designed the sanctuary and how it invites people into this holy place of worship. Generous people had to be generous givers to make all these places of worship happen. This really doesn't happen that often in the United Methodist Church because we are full of, as one commentary I read this week put it, utilitarian givers. We're practical, purposeful, and functional givers. We give sensibly, not extravagantly. We give with purpose and direction. Now through my almost 20 years of ministry now, I've noticed that there are basically five types of givers in congregations. The first one is the just right giver. These are people who don't give too much, but they don't give too little. They're kind of like Goldilocks. They give just the right amount. They may give $50 a month when their true tithe, if they look at the 10% of what their monthly income would be, would be more like $300. But $300 feels like that's a little bit too much out of reach, so they don't do that. Instead, they give just enough to be able to give to the church. Then you have the superhero givers. They won't give until there's a crisis. And when the crisis happens, then they sweep in with a large check to save the day. You're a few thousand dollars short on making the budget? Ah, you can call on those superhero givers to give. There's commitment-phobic givers. They're not going to tell you what they're going to give. It's going to be a surprise. They'll never write it down. They want the freedom to give or not to give and don't want to be held down by any sort of obligation. Their giving is erratic and is tightly tied to whether they like the pastor or the sermon or not. This is why we collect the offering before the sermon. Just to... The fourth type is the tither. They take God's request for those first fruits, that 10% uh, literally and seriously, and so they give the first before all else. It may not be the largest gift to the church. It may not be the, um, the largest one overall, but it's truly a faithful one. And I would prefer to be a pastor of a bunch of poor people who tithe than a church full of rich people who are just right givers. The last one is a rare breed. I've only heard about them in passing like the Sasquatch or Loch Ness. They are generous givers. They go well beyond the tithe. They go beyond the glory of just one big check. They give because they want to offer something to God that is extravagant and inspiring. They have a pure, generous heart. I would go as far as to say that they have a heart like Christ. In the gospel story today, we hear of Mary's extravagant gift, a generous giver. She pours a whole jar of pure nard on Jesus' feet, then wipes it dry with her hair. Pure nard comes from a flowering plant that grows in the Himalayas and Nepal and China and India. So it had to come from a long ways away to be there in Mary's hand at that house that day. She takes about the size of a soda can and anoints Jesus' feet. The smell of the perfume, it fills the entire house. No one could escape it. There'd been no way that you could ignore what was going on in that moment. Everyone notices, and everyone is aware of the type of gift that she gave. The value of that gift, of the pure nard that she uses, Judas says would be a year's wages, or about 3,000 denarii, which is, let's just say it's about $30,000 a year. Can you imagine watching a gift of $30,000 being poured onto Jesus' feet? It's such an extravagant and generous gift that the people watching, they just couldn't believe what was happening. Imagine someone walking in here with a gift to God of $30,000 of, 30, of banknotes and then shredding them right in front of everyone. It would seem like it was extremely wasteful. And we would all gasp at what was going on. Now, it's extremely plausible that Mary is going to use this to thank Jesus for raising her brother Lazarus from the dead. In John 11, 
Jesus slowly makes his way to the tomb of Lazarus, who's been dead for four days. They didn't even want to open the tomb because Lazarus' body had started to stink so badly. Yet they do, and Jesus tells him to come out, and he does. They untie his burial cloths, and now, a few verses later, they're all at a dinner party together. Martha is serving dinner, the disciples are hanging out, sharing a meal with this man who had been dead for four days just a little bit ago, sitting at the table with them. That had to be a weird dinner party. Mary and Martha had mourned for four days of the loss of their brother, and now they're sitting there with their beloved brother and the one who raised him, Jesus. Mary is so overwhelmed, she offers this extremely generous gift. She gives all of it to the one that she deeply loves, Jesus. Now, being the utilitarian givers we are, we understand Judas's reaction because there seems to be so much more we could do with $30,000. I mean, think of all the good you could do. Think of all the poor people we could help. Think of all the ways that we could use Mary's gift better than Mary could. But Mary's gift was a pure gift to God. And a true gift cannot be controlled. Think of the choir as they sing. They're offering a gift to God through the music that is being played and they're singing. They sing it, it floats out there to our ears, and then it's gone. We cannot control that gift. Dustin plays a beautiful piece of music, but our ears can't hear the ring anymore after a while. That gift is then gone. We come together to celebrate the life of a person that we love during a funeral. We feel the presence of God. We feel wrapped up in love and support, but then the service is over and that gift is gone. True gifts to God are fleeting and temporary. They don't last forever and they cannot be controlled. Jesus doesn't see this as a waste though. The beginning of this verse says that it is the sixth day before the Passover. In John's gospel, Jesus dies on Passover. He is the Paschal Lamb. It means six days after his feet are anointed, he has them nailed to a cross. Now, people did not shower and clean like we do ourselves these days. So it's extremely possible that while Jesus is on the cross, that the wind hits just right, he could smell that pure nard on his feet. While the world was shutting him out, and while he had to take on the sins of the world and feel abandoned by his heavenly Father, this oil might have been a reminder of the dedication of faith of one of his disciples, Mary. The one who later shows up to anoint his body and discover the resurrection. We need to have a mindset of abundance when we think about the generosity of God. Mary is an example of how a brazen abundance can look. It can be beautiful. We usually give out a sense of scarcity about what we might lose by giving to God instead of a place of abundance where it's a response of how much God has already given to us. So my prayer is that we learn to give like Mary. To give your all to God, because God gives all to you and to all of us. May we recognize how filled to the brim we are with the gifts from God that we generously give some back to glorify God's holy name. And all God's people said, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your son, for the ways that he is just... He makes us be in awe of what he offers us. Mary was in awe of the gift that he gave her by raising her brother. And if we look at our lives, we are in awe of all the ways that you shed your grace upon us. And so in return, may we use Mary as an example to give generously to you. May we bestow on you brazen gifts and acts of beauty that can just simply point a finger to your glory and to honor you and the grace that you give us. In your name we pray, amen.